Great Mother Isis, the goddess of healing and magic, was crucial to ancient Egyptian religious beliefs. She is known today by her Greek name, Isis. However, the ancient Egyptians called her Aset. Her name translates to Queen of the Throne, which is reflected in her headdress, which is typically a throne. Sometimes, she's also depicted with the vulture headdress of the goddess Mut, and at other times, with a disc with horns on the sides, attributed to the goddess Hathor. She took on their headdress as she assimilated their traits. Isis can also be seen as a winged goddess who brought fresh air to the underworld when she went to meet her husband. Isis was the sister and wife of the god Osiris, ruler of the underworld. Isis was also the mother of Horus, the protector of the pharaoh. The most famous story of Isis begins with Set, the jealous brother of Osiris, who dismembered him and scattered the parts of his body throughout Egypt. Isis began as a secondary figure to her husband Osiris. However, after thousands of years of worship, she was transformed into the queen of the universe and the embodiment of cosmic order. While some initially might assume the reason for this had to do with an ancient sexist view of women, in actuality, women were very much revered and the answer has more to do with the alchemy of astrotheology. Astrotheology is a term which refers to the influence of the stars and celestial bodies on religion. The original word for alchemy comes from Kemet, the ancient name for Egypt, and from where we get our word for chemistry. While most associate it with the transmutation of base metals into gold, its occult context has to do with the transmuting of mankind into spiritual gold, in a literal sense, a physical being into an immortal soul. To the Greeks, Romans, and other Aryan cultures, the moon represented the goddess. In fact, the moon itself was simply called the goddess. People spoke of doing something when the goddess rises. They would kiss their hands, extending them forward to the rising moon to greet the goddess. Magical texts give instructions for performing a certain working on the first of the goddess, meaning on the new moon. As far as recorded history is concerned, it seems that Manetho was the first that started associating Isis with the moon in the 3rd century BC. Manetho, an Egyptian priest who lived in the Ptolemaic kingdom during the Hellenistic period, and that's another way of saying the Greek period, as the Ptolemaic line stems from Alexander the Great, a Macedonian, and I've included a link in the description to a video I made on him for those that are interested. About a century after Manetho, the historian Plutarch recorded the most complete version of the Isis-Osiris myth that we have today, and it was then that the tradition of Isis as a goddess of the moon was firmly established, even in Egypt. That said, let's explore some petroglyphs together and see if we can make some sense out of them. This beautiful work of art is on the ceiling of Dendra, the Temple of Hathor. Hathor is an ancient Egyptian goddess associated later with Isis and earlier with Sekhmet, but eventually was considered the primeval goddess from whom all others were derived. Hathor's worship began early in Egypt's history, possibly in the pre-dynastic era. She was the daughter of Ra and was sometimes called the Eye of Ra, who personified the principles of love, beauty, music, dancing, fertility, and pleasure. Let's count the number of figures in this beautiful depiction. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. So there are fourteen, but why? What does that mean? It has to do with the myth concerning Osiris, 
who was dismembered into 14 parts. The Osiris myth is the most elaborate and influential story in ancient Egyptian mythology. And the reason is because the first Egyptian calendars, like those of many other ancient people, were lunar-based. In other words, Osiris was a moon god, and this temple marked the moon's changes and celebrated the lunar phases. The 28-year life of Osiris was a moon cycle, and that the 14 pieces into which his body was dismembered were the 14 days of the decline from the full moon to the new moon. In other words, Osiris was killed at the full moon. The occult significance of this story has to do with his resurrection. And while it's too complex for me to explain in this presentation, I've touched on the subject in some of my other videos concerning internal alchemy, magic with a K, and the ancient occult religion which is still practiced by many elites today in secret. Of course, the symbology of this ancient religion has changed over the millennia. The names have changed, but the significance is the same. For example, the Egyptian trinity consists of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. But when we look at Mesopotamian mythology, we call them Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz. These three characters being the start of the pagan or Aryan sun god worship throughout the world. And in the Babylonian story, Nimrod and Semiramis were the king and queen of Babylon, and Tammuz was their son, but actually a reincarnation of Nimrod. In some versions, Tammuz is killed by a wild boar. In other versions, he's cut up into pieces and spread over the world, with Semiramis collecting his parts. She finds all the parts, apart from his male organ, this prompts her to build an obelisk which becomes a phallic symbol. We can see this symbol represented in places like Washington DC with the Washington Monument, Cleopatra's Needle in London, and there's even an obelisk that was brought to Rome from Egypt by Caligula in 37 AD. And incidentally, the Christian Trinity also mirrors this myth through the Father God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hope I don't offend anyone by saying that, as anyone listening has a right to interpret their religion in any way they want, so I'm only respectfully offering my interpretation here in a historical context. That said, the Holy Ghost is often represented as a dove, an ancient symbol which represents the Mother Goddess for millennia before the Christian era, from the Greek goddess Aphrodite, who frequently appears with doves in ancient Greek pottery, to the Roman goddess Venus, the Babylonian Ishtar, or the Sumerian Inanna. The ancient Phoenicians associated Astarte, the goddess of love and fertility, with the dove. And as I've pointed out in prior videos, the Phoenicians, which was a name given to them by the Greeks, meaning blood red, are also linked to the Hyksos pharaohs, as attested to by the fact that the Phoenician deities El, Baal, and Anat are in their pantheon. The same Phoenicians, or Hyksos, a term which means foreign rulers in Egyptian, are also linked to Israelites or Canaanites. Keep in mind that the Phoenician alphabet is basically identical to the Old Hebrew script and it consists of 22 consonant letters only, which come down to 12 simples, which each of the 12 corresponding to one of the 12 zodiac signs, seven doubles, with each of them corresponding to one of the five visible planets and the sun and the moon, which is also where we get the names for the seven days of the week, and three mothers, which are represented by the three elements and also the trinity. Of course, each letter also represents a number, as the alphabet was used in magic rituals, and again, that's magic spelled with a K for those that know the difference, and in numerology, 
and other aspects of Kabbalah. And I'm talking about the ancient, real Kabbalah, not the fake stuff that people call Kabbalah these days. These Phoenicians, or Hyksos, or Israelites, eventually became some of what are referred to as the Lost Tribes, which are not really lost, as I've covered in a previous video, which I'll leave a link to in the description, but split up after leaving the Levant, only to return centuries later as the Knights Templar, and they left their mark in places like Lalibela, Ethiopia, which at one point in ancient history was also ruled by them, as was most of North Africa, including Egypt, which brings us back to Osiris, who lived 28 years, which we've already established that 28 is for the lunar month, since I also said that the same resurrection symbology can be found in Christianity, then one might ask how old was Jesus when he was crucified and resurrected? While there will probably be some debate about this, most biblical scholars will agree on the number 33, which would make sense, but why? The answer can be found once again in the heavens, and the discrepancy between the solar and lunar calendars. After 12 lunar months, we have about 354 days. This is short of the 365 days that it takes the Earth to orbit the Sun. It takes 33 years for the cycle of lunar years to get back to its original position. The lunar moon cycle, when the Sun and Moon align, repeats every 33 years. And this is why the number 33 is sacred in Freemasonry, a secret society that revered Hiram Habif, a Phoenician king of Tyre, an ancient Phoenician port city, which in myth is known as the birthplace of the goddess Europa, which is who Europe is named after. So while some claim the number 33 is derived from the number of vertebrae in the human spine, I'll remind you that not all people have the same number of vertebrae, and not all people have the same number of ribs, all people don't have the same number of teeth, for example some don't have wisdom teeth, and that's because humanity is a hybrid species made up of different hominids, just like lions and tigers can breed to make ligers and many other mammals can breed to create hybrid species, even if they have different number of chromosomes. So the 33 has nothing to do with the vertebrae, but astrotheology. Of course, the astrotheology is only the start, the basic understanding that leads down deeper rabbit holes, none of which are taught in any schools or universities, and to a large degree have been altered, misunderstood, or totally lost to the very secret societies set up to guard the secrets of this ancient alchemical knowledge. The esoteric meaning of these myths regarding resurrection, whether solar or lunar based, have to do with the building and nurturing of a light body, an aspect of consciousness which the ancient mystery schools believed would survive physical bodily death and therefore enable conscious immortality. This knowledge is the guarded spiritual secret at the core of alchemy that was born from the proper harnessing and combining of male and female energy into an exalted third, completing the sacred trinity. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon. My books make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'd also like to extend my gratitude to those that have been sharing these videos as I rely on word of mouth. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your thoughts, so please leave a comment below. Please have a wonderful week, and I hope to see you again soon.